fan of I'll go to Samway one day. Uh, he's one of the few of his kind left in Australia, but John Yard is teaching not one, but the two generations that follow him to keep the art of tinsmithing alive. In a little workshop at Goolwa, south of Adelaide, John Yard gets ready for another day at his bench, same as he's done most work days for near on 70 years. When I was at school, the headmaster said to me, Yard, all you'll be good for is digging bloody post holes. <laughs> Failed lots of times and left in grade six. I wanted to be a motor mechanic and Dad said there's no future in that, so you'll be a sheet metal worker. OK. okay. John's dad, who served in World War I, was a tinsmith too. I used to turn the handle for him when I was about 10, I suppose, when he used to buff his copper kettles. I love the stuff we do, because it's made properly, it'll last. Tinsmithing stretches back to at least the 1630s, when London tradesmen crafted plates and cups. Nearly 400 years later, 90% of tin is used for car making and packaging, with not a human hand in sight. It looks good if it's round. It looks like somebody's made it, you know. John and his handcrafted oil cans are both becoming a rare commodity. And as for this copper lamp, he charged a client $800, including materials. It took a month to make, and he's been offered five grand for its identical twin. Somebody might come in the workshop and say, oh, how much is this going to cost Johnny to make? And it puts me on a spot. And straight away, I, I'm no good. Sometimes I quoted just the material, even less, and that's no good. That's no way to run a business because I was no good at school. But almost single-handedly, this 76-year-old patriarch is keeping the trade of tinsmithing alive. Nothing wrong with that, Pop. She's rough, mate. John's grandson, Matt, and his son, Ben, are tinsmiths too. The third and fourth generations of their family to ply a trade with a rich history. And thanks to them, some kind of future too. It's some form of meditation when you're doing it the old way. This day and age, it's just go, 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 and you just... Uh, run when you're at work now instead of a more natural pace. Pop come down when I was about 14. I reckon we knocked up about four oil cans in a day. I had the opportunity to go wood or metal. Thought, shit, cut wood too short, throw it out. Cut metal too short, weld it back on. So, yeah. Matt's great-grandfather made this jewellery box the same year our Anzacs stormed ashore at Gallipoli. And like so many things in John's home, is just as solid as the day it was made. This has a diamond tip on it, never wears out. Last week, John and his wife Judy packed some of his more priceless pieces for an antique trade fair in Victoria, where a crowd of thousands could admire the fruits of a trade that might be on its last legs, but will last at least as long as the yardmen are around. People, they want to buy everything we make. And I say, no, it's not for sale, just, we just love making them. I suppose that's the reason why I don't uh, put a price on things. We've kept the wolf away from the door and paid our bills, and that's all that's in life, eh? Oh, what a great story. I love that. I love that. I love the idea he just keeps making them and don't really care about selling them too much. No. Just like the making. I love that where some of those trades are preserved, and you can see something yeah. there's so much love's gone into it because we do live in an age where we buy lots and lots of plastic and things that we just throw out. Mm. It's a great yarn. It's the preservation of culture. Mm. It's great. Love that the project. For 20 years since a young Adelaide man went missing, police are reinvestigating his suspicious disappearance. Daniel Shepherd vanished in 1999.